Hey guys, it's Tiny Tom Logan, back with another video for you. Today, I'm gonna to be taking a look at the Asus Strix Z270i Gaming. So basically, it's the Strix Z270 ITX. Don't know why they keep putting all this gaming malarkey on all the boards. It makes them feel a little bit cheap, if anything. So, ITX. Point of ITX is it's tiny. If you were to put this into your normal ATX motherboard case, the top four screws where you would normally put your motherboard in, that's how big the entire motherboard is, is pretty much just the size of the IO plate that would go onto the back of your board. So it's very compact, which means they've had to kind of make some sacrifices where they put stuff. Now I know a lot of people are going to be asking where is the uh, impact? We don't know, there might not be an impact this time. This might be the ROG ITX board, because this does come at 200 pounds, so it does put it up there, up there with the premium line of uh, motherboards. It's actually up there with the most expensive of the Strix boards as well. So if we then try to put an impact in above, I mean, I would be assuming that it would come in um, uh, above the 250 pounds mark. But when we get to the nitty gritty on this and we go around all the features, it's not lacking. The only thing that it's really not got compared to the old impact would be the daughter board with the rise of power at the top. But you'll see when we get down to have a look, I mean, I'll give you a quick look now. It's not exactly lacking anyway. So I'm gonna assume that we're probably gonna get cheaper versions or you know other models that are gonna come in below this. But um, uh, there's nothing confirmed and everyone kind of gives me the when I talk about um, a possible impact. So we'll, we'll pass by that for now. Anyway, inside the box, it's a small box, there's not a great deal in it. We do get um, a, a coaster that you can put on your desk though and it's got a little um, IR code on the back, but anyway, let's face it, you're either gonna put it on your desk or you're gonna throw it at your sister or your brother when they try and come in your room or maybe your wife if you're brave. Um, driver CD, you get your manual, this is kind of handy, and this is um, it's an extension cable for the power cables that go uh, on. So for example, when we uh, go down, you've got your reset switch there. That one's the power LED, power switch, hard drive LED, and that's just so that um, it, you've got a little bit of an extension, or maybe you could hide them. It all depends on your case, but this can be kind of handy. Also does mean that you can plug them all in and then plug one header in directly onto the board. So it makes things easier in that respect. This is a magnetic Bluetooth and Wi-Fi antenna, and you can ping it on your case. Do you know what I mean? You've got lots of options that you can do there. You get your IO shield that goes at the back. Then you have some uh, stickers so that you can identify different cables, whether you use that for SATA cables or other cables. And then other things in the box are basically the screws for the M.2s and little bits and bobs like that that we don't necessarily need to be showing you. So the board itself on its funky massive stand, what we've got here, as we kind of glance around it, you can see I've still left the sticker on the top of the chipset and the M.2. But well, uh, oh, we will peel that off. You can see that it's got a kind of a machined look to it there. There's no LED or anything behind it, but this does um, act as the heat sink for the chipset, but you can also put an M.2 underneath it as well. And what we can do is just remove the heat sink and you can see that there's a thermal pad there, but it doesn't go right to the end. So you get a little bit of uh, interface with the actual drive itself, but on my, Samsung Evo, if I was to zoom you in so that you can see, nice and close, it's gonna be difficult for me to keep my hands still, but you can see that we have a chip there, a chip there, and then like the controller chip is there. So really with this, I would say that there, it's not really doing this any favors. Now a lot of people were asking me, does it make it hotter? Because you've obviously got the chipset underneath as well. Now I didn't experience any drive increases in temperature but at the same time i didn't necessarily see any decreases either so it's a pretty way that you can kind of hide your m.2 and obviously with an itx board you've only got to take a couple of screws off and it means you can get easy access to it the only other place that you've got is round the back now if you put it round the back uh depending on your case you could quite it could be stuck and you might not be able to get access to this without actually removing the motherboard altogether 
If you have got one where you've got a vertical motherboard tray that you can get access to to get at the back of the CPU slot, one of the things I might say is you might want to think about breaking the Dremel out and cutting a section if you did want to use this. Um, because uh, if you were to do that, you could go about 15 millimeters in from the corners and then just make yourself a nice big cutout. Like I said, you're gonna need a back panel that you can take off. Some of the motherboards, uh, sorry, some of the cases for ITX boards, they lay in flat and you might have a power supply or something underneath. So it's very case specific, but it's an idea for you there to try. While we've got everything um, open though, one of the things I can talk to you about is we have a power header here. I've now worked out where they all are. A power header, see, I'm getting all my words mixed up. We have a fan header, fan, fan header. And it's PWM here. There's another one nestled just in here by the chipset. And there's another one up here at the top. I was quite happy the fact that we did get at least a decent CPU fan, you know, so that it's kind of at the top of the board. But I do think it would have been nice if we'd had another one somewhere, maybe down this side or something, basically so that you could get access to the, the fans without having to kind of hide underneath your graphics card and stuff. So the cabling to use the other two might be a little bit messy if you're trying to get them into the uh, front of the case. We do have, talking about the front of the case, a USB 3.1 internal header up on this side, which is kind of cool. It's still powered by an eight pin, even though it is a tiny board. You do get uh, an RGB out just down here for your Asus Aura stuff, so you can connect um, RGB strips inside the case or anything else that's using RGB because there's going to be quite a lot of it coming out shortly. Uh, hard drive connectors, you get four SATA, they're all vertical. Um, if you're worried about big cables with these, something that I can suggest that you go and do is Silverstone make some amazing small thin SATA cables and you would be able to hide those really really nicely and get them to disappear off the side. They do some ugly blue ones but they have brought out some black ones now. So if normal SATA cables are going to do your boxing, go and have a look because you'll be able to route them. Even if you had to use these ones, you would be able to get two of those cables out between the top of the PCR Express here and the, the RAM slot and you'd be able to get them out and you'd hardly notice them. So uh, if normal SATA cables are gonna do your boxing, go and take a look at those. As I've said, we do have a lot of power phases around the board, so it should be ample enough to be able to keep a relatively decent overclock in tow, but only time's gonna tell and we will talk about performance in a little bit. When we get round to the back, you've got um, USB 3.1 up here and you've got a C and uh, an A. You've got four USB 2s, DisplayPort, HDMI, two USB 3s, Gigabit Intel LAN. Then you've got um, wireless and Bluetooth here, which is what I showed you for the antenna. And then you've got your audio out. You can also see, just hidden down here, some Japanese capacitors for the uh, audio. There's another one hidden down here. And this weird thing here with the red and white cable is actually a BIOS battery. So if you want to remove the BIOS battery on this, you actually do have to take out the cable on that little white connector there and that's how you disconnect it if you wanted to clear the BIOS for anything. We did talk about the M.2 around the back so that's there for any of you out there that uh, want to get two M.2s on. M.2s are obviously becoming a lot more kind of commonplace now and you can pick them up without actually having to uh, sell your grandma or leash your kidney to be able to get one. I do like the fact that you can still tell that this is still a Strix board as well and if I pop the heatsink back on I do think it's got a really nice aesthetic. These are actually some, despite them being not massive, because they're not particularly thick uh, heat sinks for the MOSFETs, because that's what these parts are actually cooling, it's actually quite a strong design. I like the fact it's monochrome, you introduce the color with the other components or the lights, and it does all fit kind of nice. I'm glad to say that we've got rid of like the red flashing and all that sort of stuff, and we've gone gray. It does feel a lot more grown up. So moving on to some performance, one of the things I can talk to you about with the overclock is the board was a bit of a shocker. And yes, I do mean it was a bit of a shocker. And yes, I am messing around putting boxes and stuff in the background because we do have some stuff to talk about. Uh, memory, there's only two dim slots on it. A lot of people will be shouting, but it did manage to get uh, 4,266 megahertz memory running with a simple XMP um, uh, tick. I was very impressed with that, very, very impressed with that. The only other board that's ever done that is the Maximus 9 Apex. So, 4266 memory without a hitch. 
Overclocked for the CPU, I did manage to get the CPU running at 5.1 gigahertz to 100% um, stable to match the other um, clocks that I've got with the much bigger boards as well. I did get a screenshot for 5.2, but there were a couple of my benchmarks that didn't like the overclock and were failing, not blue screening, but failing. Um, so we knocked it on the head and we went for 5.2. Memory wise, I did notice that above 4,000 megahertz, we were still getting a little bit of an increase from 4133 and 426. Six, but it had got to the point where there wasn't a big increase it was fraction you know it, we, it was like 50 points going from 4000 to uh, 4266 now when we tested the board it was on the launch bios which was 0233 and what that tells me is going above 4000 megahertz with it on the launch bios the the board was auto kind of slackening off the timings the sub timings for the book for the memory to get it to run and to get it to be uh, stable. Now this is all very good, it would mean that at home you wouldn't notice anything, but when we, uh, we've tested so much of this stuff and so much memory, it was something that we instantly picked up on. So what I ended up doing was having the 5.1 gigahertz CPU overclock and we ended up running a 4,000 megahertz memory kit to do our overclock test today, which you'll see in the graphs that are just popping up on your screen like magic. So first of all, 3D Mark, what we can see is the ITX board, um, has done very well um, in the stock mode, but it really did come into its own with the overclock. And when you look above, it's really the Apex and the, uh, the Strix formula, the 270 full ATX version. And really, the difference between this board and the full ATX version, there was literally a couple of points in it. Really wasn't a great deal there. It was literally almost like we'd retested the full-size ATX Strix formula board again. When we move over to gaming, the, um, the stock tests that we did on this were very, very strong. It actually come in, in second place on, for stock tests. With the, the overclock there, didn't do as well, but again, we need to kind of remember we were on a very early BIOS on this, um, and no, I, I would I would genuinely think that this will be something that will improve over time. Um, where the other boards in the ASUS range are all on the 0701 BIOS at the moment, and we've had Chinese New Year. I would almost be adamant that the first update on this is likely to be the 0801 BIOS, which they're working on at the moment. And to be honest with you, I'd, I would have preferred to have waited and tested it on that later BIOS, but we pushed through so that we could get you some early numbers. When we move on to Cinebench, this is R15. This is a great CPU rendering test. And what we can see is the stock stuff, it did okay. It's in the pack, there's only a few points between them. I think there's like six points between most of them, six or eight points, and it did very well. Introduce that overclock though, and Bang, it's actually up there arguing for places with the Apex. Uh, so it went in front of all of the other ATX boards um, and was literally just only beat to the top spot by the Apex, which is obviously a hardcore overclocking board. Something that a lot of people seem to do at home is uh, render or re-encoding videos so that you can use it for your phone or maybe you want to store it so that you can stream it and that sort of thing. And uh, with the X265 benchmark, which is the HVAC stuff, the, uh, the ITX did come in in fourth place for the, um, the stock. But yet again, it went to the second place for the, um, the overclock, only being beaten by the, uh, the Apex itself, the full, you know, blown overclocking board. So, on to a conclusion. Uh, you can, if, you're, if you would like to, go and have a look for the uh, full review and all of the other tests because we have got an awful lot of other tests. It's like a 22-page review on the main OC3D website. So if you're in interested in comparing the results with all the other boards that we've tested, the giant graphs are there because that's how we try and do our reviews. And I know it doesn't necessarily translate impeccably well onto YouTube, but hey, do you know what I mean? This is just our way of doing it. So... Uh, people are going to moan about the £200 price tag. That's fair enough. I understand that. It does look a bit like Pro Gamer, but they've squeezed a lot more onto the board. The best way to look at this is it's kind of like a, not necessarily a downgraded impact, but it's not got the, the kind of bright red rock impact kind of branding and it's a little bit more understated and um, the, with the prices and stuff at the moment that's obviously a big political debate 
but they have put an awful lot onto this board and for an ITX board you are going to struggle to get any more on there. The performance is there though, so the fact it's so small and they've got it all crammed in, there's, you've not really had to take a hit on that. So if you were going to chuck a graphics card on this and you just wanted to play games, then it's, it's an absolute barnstormer. But to be fair, even though it is small, it can hold those massive overclocks. I've only had two motherboards that have XMP'd 4,266 megahertz memory, and that's this and the Apex. I'm not necessarily thinking that many of you are gonna go out and buy that sort of memory, but it does show the caliber um, uh, beneath the board and how hard they've worked on the BIOS. Because at this present moment in time, I've had nothing other, and I've tested a lot of the um, other brands' boards behind the scenes, and I'm always being asked to wait for BIOS upgrades. Um, so that it'll be like, oh, I've tested it, it doesn't do this, and they go, Tom, don't do the review there, can you please wait for a BIOS? A lot of other sites don't care because they've not been testing the high-speed memory, or they've not been really pushing the overclocks, or they've not been paying attention to when they've been doing their testing, so they're not picking up on this stuff, but I'm constantly being asked to not, you know, to wait to do reviews, which is why I've been moving around. It's also why I've done this, and this has jumped the queue from some of the other boards, but 4266 straight out the box with a launch BIOS, so the scores should only get better. It did that with really tight timings and it put out some really, really good scores. The only kind of semi-disappointing scores were the gaming at stock. And to be fair, even that was still in the, well in the thick of the pack with all of the other expensive uh, full-sized ATX boards. And like I said, with a launch BIOS, we know things are going to get better and I'd be, I'd be gobsmacked if they don't get uh, a couple frames per second out of those gaming results. So all in all, it's an amazing compact board, and to be fair, it's thoroughly deserving, even with that launch BIOS of the OC3D Performance Award. But for now at least, this has been a very quick and hidden face review from the, the Logan Meister himself. But for now at least, this is Tiny Tom Logan with another video for you, out.